Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for connecting today. I'm Tobias Adrian, the financial counselor and director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department of the International Monetary Fund. I'm glad to welcome you to this Cam de Sue Central Banking Lecture, our annual lecture series devoted to the many challenges facing central banks. This is the second time that this event is held in virtual format, reflecting the ongoing challenges posed by the pandemic. But while we are not able to welcome you here in DC, we have the pleasure of live streaming this event to a broad group of distinguished guests and colleagues from around the world. Previous Come to Sue lectures have featured illustrious speakers from a variety of central banks. For this eighth edition, we are honored and privileged to have with us Mr. Alejandro Diaz de Leon, Governor of the Bank of Mexico. His lecture will commence in a few moments and will be followed by a conversation between him and our Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva. But before that, it is my pleasure to first give the floor to the Managing Director for her opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tobias, and let me join you in welcoming all online to the eighth Michel Camdesieu lecture. It is our signature lecture series on the role of central banks. And what I would do now is to enjoy the privilege to welcome and introduce our speaker today, Alejandro Diaz de Leon. He's coming to address us in the midst of a global recovery, and yet while in some countries the rebound is strong, fault lines are widening between economies. The 6% growth that we are projecting for the world this year is the same 6% we projected in April. But between April and, July, and July, the composition of this 6% has changed. Now, some economies are projected to grow faster. Uh, and Alejandro, I'm so pleased to tell the audience that this includes Mexico, where we are predicting growth of 6.3% this year and 4.2% uh, next year. This is an upgrade of more than 1% in both cases, thanks to two things, progress in vaccinations and positive spillovers from the strong US recovery. But what is true for Mexico, unfortunately, is not true for many other emerging markets and practically for almost all uh, developing economies. They are projected to grow slower than we anticipated in April. This difference is primarily due to dramatic differences in vaccine availability and as a result in infection rates and also to availability of fiscal space to act. Navigating our way out of this dangerous situation requires careful choices by policymakers, including by central bankers. And they have stepped up, responding swiftly to address the financial market turmoil at the onset of the pandemic, and then dealing with an economy put in a standstill. This required nimble crisis management, massive policy stimulus, and handling complex operational challenges to keep financial systems functioning smoothly, and they are doing that. So what lessons did central banks learn from this crisis? Well, similarly, getting out of the pandemic will be challenging for central banks. How will they calibrate the withdrawal of stimulus when models and data are not applicable, when history cannot teach us all the necessary uh, lessons, and when uncertainty remains extreme, when the extent of scarring is still unknown. It will be there, but how much and how to deal with it 
is so hard to project. When we have questions around markets' willingness to finance high public and corporate debt levels, will that willingness stay or change rapidly? What should be the guiding principles to navigate our exit? And finally, what will the post-pandemic landscape look like? How will central banks adapt their tools and deal with changes in preferences for digital money that are accelerated by the pandemic? What will be the biggest challenges for central banks in the days, months, and years to come? So these are just a sample of the difficult questions being faced by central bankers everywhere. And so we have Alejandro to help us answer them. Cannot be happier than in that search for answers, we can tap into your immense expertise in your track record of actions to further strengthen the Bank of Mexico's position as one of the most respected and agile central banks. So let me say a couple of words about Alejandro. Most distinguished career in public service. Back in 1991, he started out at the Bank of Mexico, where he held various positions, including Director of Macroeconomic Analysis, Director of Economic Studies. He worked then closely with Augustine Carstens, who would later serve as Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. And he overlapped with another young and promising Alejandro, Alejandro Werner who came to be the fund's director for our Western Hemisphere Department for many years. These personal connections highlight the close and continuous relationship between our institutions. Alejandro also demonstrated remarkable versatility. In 2007, he became general director of the National Pension Fund of State Workers, followed by a stint as the head of the debt management office at Mexico's Ministry of Finance. Subsequently, he headed Mexico's Export-Import Bank until 2017, then returned to the Bank of Mexico and took the helm in 2018. Alejandro has shown outstanding leadership. He impressed his peers by navigating a range of difficult challenges high inflation at the start of his term, which he successfully reduced, and of course, the pandemic, where the central bank played a key role in the crisis response through a well-calibrated loosening of monetary policy and through clear communications and strengthened transparency, including by the publication of inflation reports. And boy, is that of interest now that inflation is so much uh, a matter of um, concentration uh, for so many. So uh, little wonder with all these uh, accomplishments, uh, the uh, Central Bank Banking Journal recently named him Central Banker of the Year in 2021, a historic achievement. Uh, so very deeply honored, Alejandro, that you have accepted our invitation to deliver the uh, uh, Michel Camdesu lecture. We look very much to your thoughts. You got the questions uh, that need answers, and I have no doubt that we will learn a lot from what you have to say. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, <clears throat> dear Managing Director, Cristalina. Thank you very much for your very kind words. Uh, I would like to first uh, I appreciate uh, and, and uh, inviting me to, to be in these years, Michel Camdesul's uh, Central Banking Lecture. It is a true honor for me and for Banco de Mexico. And let me highlight uh, first that, that uh, we have been and we are very grateful for your leadership and for the space and voice and attentiveness uh, for emerging markets. And, and for that, we are uh, very grateful and, and also very honored for the opportunity. Um, it is, it, it is clearly uh, uh, for us, for uh, here at the Central Bank, an honor to speak at this Michel Camdesu Central Banking Lecture. He's remembered around the world for his leadership, particularly in Mexico, 
1995, following his convictions and putting his reputation on the line, he pushed forward a historic support program for Mexico that helped us deal with a black swan event. This episode shows that even though great institutions such as the fund should be faceless, when immense trade-offs and historical decisions are on the line, personal leadership is essential to maintain the commitment to best serve the institution's mandate. We are very fortunate that this long-term oriented strong leadership tradition continues with Cristalina, who has successfully faced a once in a generation human catastrophe and a global recession with strong resolution, and I would say with a, always a very constructive and positive attitude. Let me start with a very long-term emerging market perspective, looking into some of the key challenges we have faced in what I will refer to as the long and slippery road to development. This will be useful as a background to address some of the most pressing challenges we currently face, and an illustration of our quest for long-term development. The year 2021 is special for my country, as it marks the 200th anniversary of the consummation of Mexico's independence. When a country comes into being, it can have a shared vision of the future and of the type of institutions it needs. For instance, in the US, the US Constitution signed in 1787 remains the cornerstone of the US as a nation, as a nation uh, even today. Mexico's debut as an independent country was characterized by a strongly divided nation with two polar views on how the state and society should interact between a centralized empire and a federal republic. This launched the country into a tailspin of civil wars, opened the door for foreign intervention and all kinds of instability, all of which hindered the development of the country and the well-being of the population. Almost 100 years after gaining independence, a broadly shared constitution was enacted in Mexico in 1917, providing the foundations for social and political interaction and economic development. The Constitution also envisaged the first central bank as an entity of the state. This goal materialized in 1925, when Banco de Mexico was created. We cannot underestimate the importance of stability and clarity in the legal foundation of the institutional pyramid, the Constitution, which is the cornerstone for sound and sustainable social and economic progress. I am convinced that when a country lacks a broadly shared vision of the future, it cannot enjoy a stable present, as it is continuously pulled into zero-sum quarrels and attempt to backpedal policies. The first dimension of the foundational principles in a national debate includes the form of government, the transfer of power, and recognizing essential human and civil rights. The second dimension relates to the institutional design needed for social, political, and economic development. This has been highly elusive for several emerging market countries, especially in Latin America, trapping the region in a highly persistent, slow development equilibrium, making it unable to reach what I would call the underdevelopment scape velocity. Many factors share the blame in this unfortunate outcome. This shows how difficult it is to endogenously chain the incentives and the institutional setup in a rent-driven economy, making it hard to attain an efficient and highly productive incentive-based economy. This mainly occurs because the low-hanging fruit for, for both politician and economic interest groups is to maintain the status quo where out outcomes are tilted towards favoring incumbents rent extraction at the expense of the well-being of broad sectors of society. This creates societies where effective social mobility ladders are scarce, inequality is perpetuated, and polarization becomes endemic. In this context, politicians sometimes tend to fall into the short-term trap of exploiting the oppressor-oppressed debate, exacerbating contrast and deepening polarization, making a shared vision of the future a more elusive goal. We should not forget that constructive politics is the art of finding common ground between different individual interests and the common good. When these objectives are reconciled, societies get closer to their true potential in terms of economic, political and social outcomes. To attain progress and development, history and experience provide ample evidence in favor of market economies with strong and stable forms of government that provide critical public goods. I would mention the rule of law, which ensures personal security, contract certainty, and well-defined property rights, a level playing field for all, 
including equal opportunities to access high quality education and health services for all social groups, strong incentives for the most efficient allocation of scarce uh, resources, leading to profitable long-term investments and higher growth, and economic stability, which includes price stability, financial stability, and low volatility of output around potential. And this is where central banks get into the equation. To overcome the long and slippery road to development, we need a shared vision of the future with a comprehensive set of principles and policies that considers the idiosyncratic characteristics of our complex economic and social ecosystems. Moving to better outcomes sometimes requires self-adopted multilateral commitments. This explains why some arrangements like trade agreements and economic unions have been useful as means to commit to long-term strategies and reduce adverse short-term political struggles. Emerging markets road to development requires an economic and financial integration to the global economy, along with domestic regulation and incentives aligned with best practices and proven approaches and strategies. Multilateral and international financial institutions have a historic opportunity to increase their catalytic role in emerging markets development, fostering the adoption of these comprehensive approaches. If we could go as far as reaching a new, comprehensive, and detailed shared vision of emerging markets development with clear incentives and opportunity cost for key decision makers, it could have the potential of improving the fortunes of hundreds of millions of people. Let me now turn to the role of central banks in emerging markets during the pandemic and beyond. Central banks play an instrumental role in all economies. Price and financial stability are key public goods needed for sustainable growth and development even more so in the challenging context of the pandemic. This is why independent central banks are a crucial element of the institutional framework and their actions must be insulated from political pressures to focus on long-term stability, creating an environment conducive to economic growth and social development. The pandemic caused a synchronized global economic recession with large shocks in the financial and real sectors. First, we faced a sharp increase in risk aversion in global financial markets with a strong impact on emerging markets in terms of capital outflows, foreign exchange rate depreciation, and higher risk premia. What was expected to be a transitory shock has become longer lasting and with significant heterogeneous effects across countries, sectors, and groups in society. These had major consequences for face-to-face -face services and for the informal sectors, which are very important in emerging markets. The pandemic also accelerated ongoing trends, posing worrisome challenges, widening the technological divide among individual and firms, and increasing inequality in education and development opportunities. While advanced economies implemented historic stimulus programs, emerging markets faced policy trade-offs and a more limited policy space. The pandemic significantly affected economic activity, external financing, and public revenues. The policy space has been more constrained than in advanced economies due to a dependence on external sources of finance, less resilient fiscal accounts, and weak and procyclical fiscal revenues. Taking into consideration the unprecedented nature of the shock and the deep social scars it has caused, emerging markets have faced the challenge of supporting the economic recovery without compromising macroeconomic and financial stability. As capital importer economies, emerging markets need to keep ample sources of financing and continuously attract foreign investment. This requires a strong and resilient macro mix, being conscious of the policy space available under additional adverse scenarios and following a risk management approach as part of policy making. Being mindful of the policy space does not justify inaction. Comprehensive packages of near-term support should be implemented jointly with credible medium-term strategies, anchoring macroeconomic sustainability and promoting pro-growth structural reforms. Despite facing a more complex and heterogeneous set of trade-offs, central banks in emerging markets loosened monetary policy considerably and proved provided liquidity when needed. In the first months of the pandemic, global risk aversion and domestic financial markets volatility call for a broad set of measures to supply liquidity and credit. In April 2020, Banco de Mexico announced up to 3.3 percentage points of GDP in several financing facilities. For Mexico, the IMF's flexible credit line was a highly valued complement 
for our external liquidity buffers at the times of acute stress. In addition to avoiding a risk aversion spiral, we needed to support the recovery through an orderly and sustained reduction of interest rates along the yield curve. This implies being mindful not only of short-term interest rates, but also of the medium and long-term rates, which in emerging markets are largely determined by risk premia. Thus, to attain lower financing costs along the yield curve, a solid macroeconomic framework is required with fiscal sustainability, price stability, and a resilient financial sector. Regarding monetary policy instruments, asset purchase programs should not be considered over-the-counter measures in emerging markets. Policymakers need to be mindful that central bank financing to governments can fall into a situation of fiscal dominance. Stress tests of fiscal sustainability and availability of sources of finance are needed to avoid situations that could lead to financial repression or monetization of fiscal deficits. Unfortunately, in the past, Latin America had many of these painful episodes that caused incommensurable, long-lasting damage. Also, if asset purchase programs in emerging markets were perceived as central bank financing of governments, it would exert pressure on risk premia, the exchange rate, and capital outflows, contrary to the original objective of seeking to ease financial conditions. Emerging markets have different degrees of integration and exposures to global downturns and episodes of risk aversion, but they are all subject to larger monetary policy trade-offs that need to be considered in the central bank's reaction function. In a small and open emerging market economies, the traditional monetary policy role of keeping inflation around the target and reducing output volatility around potential faces additional challenges. External and idiosyncratic shocks rarely work exclusively on the demand side, and they tend to include a supply side and financial dimension that increases policy trade-offs. For example, shocks to the terms of trade, global risk appetite, and sovereign credit risk put additional pressure on the exchange rate, capital flows, and on the financial system. And these factors rarely coincide with output gap pressures on prices, often exerting opposing forces on inflation. This results in more complex monetary policy trade-offs. This was precisely the case during the pandemic, as we faced an unprecedented aggregate demand and supply-related contraction together with a financial shock. Thus, policymaking in emerging markets faced acute, acute trade-offs with limited space. In Mexico, we experienced a significant foreign exchange uh, rate adjustment and a record contraction of non-resident holdings of government securities. Also, in spite of a sharp economic contraction since June last year, inflation has remained clearly above target. The economic recovery will clearly be heterogeneous, and Kristalina highlighted that just a few minutes ago. As a result of different, differentiated advances in the vaccination process and in policy support across countries. The unprecedented fiscal stimulus in the US will support the world economy but it could also exert pressures on medium and long-term interest rates in the US and on global financial conditions. Thus, the outlook for the world economy and financial markets will be strongly influenced by the US recovery and its inflation dynamics. In advanced economies, several structural factors, even demographic trends, have induced lower potential GDP growth, lower levels of inflation, and a lower real neutral interest rate. They have experienced inflation below target for long periods of time. These conditions will allow their central banks to be very patient in the wake of higher inflation. Emerging markets are not in the same position. We have less policy space as price formation faces higher risks and inflation and its expectations have not been persistently below target. Even if the scenario is of transitory increases in inflation in the US, a smooth path is unlikely, and financial markets will be subject to volatility episodes exerting pressure on emerging markets' financial conditions. To benefit the most from the US-led recovery, emerging market economies need to promote an orderly adjustment of their domestic financial markets. This requires, again, a strong macroeconomic policy mix where fiscal sustainability and price stability play a key role containing risk premia throughout the yield curve. The massive fiscal and monetary policy stimulus, stimulus adopted by advanced and large capital surplus economies 
must not create the impression that these approaches are also available for emerging market economies. We must remain conscious about our policy constraints and our susceptibility to external and idiosyncratic shocks. Finally, let me highlight three areas where uh, international financial institutions, IFIs, can play a, a key role to promote a stronger and more sustainable recovery, a more resilient global financial architecture, and a fast-paced development of uh, low- and middle-income countries. First, emerging markets development requires strong macro policies and a consistent integration strategy to the world economy. In this regard, the very valuable IMF's integrated policy framework could be useful not only to expand the instrument toolkit to face international capital flows and other shocks, but also to develop a policy roadmap to stay the course towards a stronger, deeper, and long-lasting trade and financial integration. This could help us address current and future challenges without reducing our economy's resilience and aligning national strategies towards deeper financial markets and better medium and long-term social outcomes. Additionally, the IMF, along with other IFIs, could develop a clear and detailed set of concrete policies and regulatory approaches, similar to those that have proven to be very successful in some economic unions or regions, to foster investment and development and complement them with low-cost targeted funding. Emerging markets could voluntarily ad adhere to the observance of a broad set of standards and recommendations, like currently the ROSC works for the financial sector, but with a broader scope. Second, IFIs can develop new approaches to quickly mobilize capital when financing uh, global systemic shocks, when facing global systemic shocks. Loan guarantee programs could be designed to leverage more resources, attract private investors, and allow countries to access financing through international capital markets for specific programs like vaccination or much needed green and sustainable projects. Third, the pandemic has deepened the digital divide within and across jurisdictions, making it clear that technology adoption and financial inclusion have become an imperative for all. IFIs can play a critical role in promoting last generation financial infrastructure. New technology and payment infrastructure offer invaluable options to advance financial inclusion and can become the cornerstone of the best forms of digital money and central bank digital currencies. In this effort, we need to move fast with the right strategies and approaches to develop the best digital financial ecosystems where big techs and fintechs could be included following five key principles. First, universal access. Second, same risk, same regulation. Third, interoperability and network neutrality. Fourth, we need to foster competition, avoiding king-making mergers and alliances that tend to be this kind, in these kinds of networks. And fifth, promote strong consumer protection. We strongly welcome the, 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 the support and, and the steps taken by the IMF in this direction, and it will help all of the membership to address the broad set of challenges of the new era of digital money. We hope that this line of work can attain concrete short-term recommendations and deliverables, helping all central banks to develop new forms of money and fully operable CBDCs in a very short period of time. Otherwise, private crypto assets hungry for senior edge returns could consolidate as acceptable, let me call them, barter tokens. These alternatives, which could have partial functions as a medium of exchange, grossly fail as a store of value, unit of account, and as a fully acceptable and efficient payment instrument. This can seriously affect the public goods delivered by the central bank's provision of money, thus jeopardizing financial stability, weakening consumer protection, and deteriorating social outcomes. Let me conclude by, by highlighting that when emerging markets face either the structural or perennial challenges of the long and slippery road to development, or unforeseen and acute disruptions like the shocks derived from the pandemic, these are better addressed when broad mutual trust allows to attain a shared vision of the future and creative solutions that can improve social out outcomes, both at the national and at the international levels. 
And in that, in that regard, we are very grateful by the IMF efforts and by Kristalina's efforts in particular to have this broad shared vision at the international level. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and looking forward for the uh, Q&A uh, session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alejandro. Uh, this was fantastic. Uh, you managed to bring both the immediate challenges we face stepping into the recovery from this uh, crisis and the long-term transformation that uh, we ought to embrace so we can uh, continue to deliver as international financial institutions and also central banks in their mandate. Uh, I cannot be more grateful uh, to you for adding so much color to this vision we have to embrace as a world. And uh, uh, listening to you, so many questions uh, uh, came to my mind that uh, I'm sure the audience would be uh, interested to hear more uh, from you. Uh, and let me start with one that is really pressing in this world of diverging recoveries. It is very likely that if that divergence that has deepened uh, over the uh, last months uh, continues, we would see some central banks uh, debating and acting on uh, withdrawal of monetary policy support, tightening financial conditions. And so my question to you as a very experienced, uh, not only central banker, but uh, uh, thinker on these uh, uh, issues, how do you see the future? Should we find ourselves in a situation when advanced economies are growing fast and they are moving also faster than anticipated into tightening of financial conditions. What would, especially uh, this uh, happening in the United States, would have uh, tremendous implications. What should emerging markets and developing economies do? Where do you see the risks and where do you see opportunities for the right policy action in that uh, context. Well, Christina, you posed uh, probably the, the, the key question that all central bankers and policymakers in, in emerging markets are, are questioning ourselves. We are seeing, uh, and as you have mentioned this, a crisis like no other with implications uh, we have not seen in the previous uh, decades. So it's, we have had even a hard time forecasting GDP growth, even non-performing loans in our financial systems. This a very sudden stop uh, in, uh, in economic activity last year, and this uh, different rhythm of uh, reopening has created a very heterogeneous landscape, both within our countries and across uh, uh, countries. And this has created challenges that we have never experienced before. I think what we have seen clearly advanced economies tend to have more policy space, both on the, both on the fiscal and on the monetary side and also have been able to have a, a more uh, readily available uh, access to uh, vaccines. And this, as you mentioned at the beginning, is creating a two-speed recovery. The speed recovery fast of the economies that have uh, more policy space and, and more the, uh, vaccines available, and the rest uh, of the countries that are not in that, in that situation. And this may, may, may create the tension that some of the inflationary pressures uh, that come through international prices and that could be reflected into financial markets could uh, represent some headwind into emerging markets and the rest of, of the countries with less policy space. And, and I think we, we have to try to find uh, how we can um, link our economies more with these uh, advanced economies and large economies and, and, and regions that are recovering faster and how to uh, weather these potential headwind and, and being mindful of, of this policy space, probably it, it will allow uh, large economy central banks to be extremely patient. And if that is the case, that means that probably the, 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 only, the, the additional uh, material concern will be our homegrown inflationary uh, pressures. Uh, but if they don't coincide, 
with these uh, monetary policy uh, decisions coming from advanced economies, I think that can create uh, a better trade-off in terms of uh, not necessarily having all of the headwind coming from uh, tighter uh, global uh, financial conditions. That, that still uh, remains to be determined. I think we, we all uh, are going to be extremely uh, data dependent because we are in uncharted uh, territory. And I think what we need to be mindful is that we, need try, we should try to make our financial markets, FX markets, uh, fixed income markets, uh, uh, try to adjust and to cope in the most orderly way uh, possible. And I think uh, also uh, the, the, the policy space uh, in emerging markets has, has diminished because of the pandemic itself. So uh, we need to be cautious on, on how we use that uh, uh, space and how we've remained resilient so we can benefit the most from this uh, uh, phase of recovery. Uh, great, uh, great uh, uh, comments. We do need to recognize we are in this together. Advanced economies do need to think about the uh, spillover effects of their actions and be very careful about taking them, communicating very clearly about it. And emerging markets uh, need to be uh, more open to look at the whole set of policy tools at their disposal, which takes me uh, straight to my next question. Uh, what do you see as main pros and cons of using additional tools beyond the uh, policy uh, rates? And what has been your experience? What do you see the future holding in that regard? Yes, I, I think, uh, Kristalina, that we, we need to be uh, uh, fully aware that um, uncharted uh, conditions and uncharted territory should be met with all of the options uh, should be on the table. And, and I think we need to be very uh, mindful about the different trade-offs uh, associated with uh, those policy options. Uh, in the case of Mexico, for example, we literally uh, had no option in, in late 94 and 95 uh, to, but, but other to, to float the currency. Mm -hmm. And I remember very well in those years uh, that probably uh, no one in this building was truly, uh, truly believed that a, a truly float, free floating exchange rate regime could be attained because we, we, we never saw that in the previous decades. But uh, since those days, there was a very strong conviction in trying to develop a, a flexible uh, exchange rate. And at, at those times, we had to intervene sometimes uh, with a heavier hand, sometimes with a lesser heavier hand. Our goal was always to develop a deep and liquid uh, exchange rate market. And we have been able to, to attain that. Uh, the peso is the second emerging market uh, most liquid and, and more uh, heavily traded uh, in the world after the renminbi. And uh, this clearly has been to, the, to Mexico's advantage to have a floating exchange rate to work <clears throat> as a shock absorber to the different shocks that we face. So sometimes you need to uh, intervene, but we need to be also very judicious on how we intervene. Because sometimes if you intervene too much, that may derail you from your long-term goal. And our long-term goal was to develop a deep and liquid FX market. And uh, you, you need to, to be mindful of the different uh, instruments uh, that, that you can, can use in order to cushion, to cushion uh, these, these shocks, but always uh, being, ha having in mind uh, your medium and long-term goals. For example, some of these uh, capital control management measures, uh, they, they, they may be for cer certain uh, countries on, in certain considerations, something that they uh, use given their conditions but they may push you back a few steps into the development of a liquid uh, floating exchange rate regime. Every country has to analyze these trade-offs uh, in the most judicious manner, and I would say not losing uh, one of the eyes on the medium and long-term trends that those decisions could lead you. And this is something we take very much to heart at the IMF. Uh, uh, as you know, there is a huge uh, body of work uh, we are undertaking exactly for that to understand clearly uh, how the uh, policy framework can be more uh, adequately developed. And uh, the term integrated policy framework is one that we, we use in that regard. I mean, you, you, you spoke, uh, and obviously one of these long-term goals is financial stability, and you spoke uh, very, uh, very clearly about uh, the uh, significance uh, uh, maintaining financial stability has in your work. Um, 
one thing we have done after the global financial crisis is to embrace macroprudential policies. Uh, and we count a lot on macroprudential policies uh, to help us in this pursuit of uh, financial stability. What role do you see for them? How do you see building forward uh, macroprudential uh, policies on the basis of what we are learning in this crisis? I, I, I agree with you that uh, financial stability is, is of the essence and that we have learned a lot in the last uh, couple of decades of uh, how to be more aware and mindful of some of the uh, risks that may be sometimes unadvertedly, sometimes with not a, with not a clear uh, shock or price uh, movement, but they may be accumulating in a low frequency, in a medium to long-term horizon trend. And, and sometimes they may have different or origins and probably in uh, advanced economies, uh, asset prices and, and, and house bubbles uh, tend to be one of the key uh, elements. In emerging markets, sometimes uh, uh, capital inflows that may have uh, induced uh, over leverage and that may induce uh, probably too much optimistic views about prices or the value of collateral and so on, may be behind some of these challenges that precisely the macroprudential uh, policies uh, should allow us and help us into avoiding those sometimes unadverted uh, risks uh, that we may, may face, but they can sometimes jump at, at us in a very dramatic uh, fashion. And I think we need, we need to use macroprudential policies in, in a way to, to, with three key elements. One is we need to learn from the past. We cannot avoid things that, uh, let's say, we, we know that they didn't work and we need to fix. We need to fix wh what we know that it doesn't work. And that's why in 2008 eight and nine, all of the body of work to upgrade financial regulation was uh, of the essence. And I think it was very good that this, this was a global effort. And all of our countries had a, a much resilient financial uh, systems precisely uh, because of those uh, efforts. The second dimension is that we need to be flexible and we need to respond to shocks. And I think COVID is a very good example. All of our countries allow for uh, different uh, flexibility and areas where the financial sector could jointly work with households and firms in order to preserve credit quality. And I think that that was very, very uh, useful. And the third is that we need to be uh, mindful of potential uh, shocks, future shocks, and, be, and, be, uh, and, and include them in our radar screen. We cannot have blind spots. And this clearly goes into climate risk, uh, uh, which is very, very material, sometimes unadvertedly, but with a very clear effect. And we need to avoid having a, a, a snapback and a rapid adjustment uh, and a wake up uh, in, 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 due to that risk. And the other one, which is taking place for many, for many years now, is how technology is introduced into the financial services. And we need to be mindful about cyber risks and how we can, we need to avoid what I would call this uh, tech shadow banking uh, that could materialize. We need to be very mindful on how to use technology to our advantage, to our citizens' advantage, but avoid uh, risks. Yes, very wise uh, uh, words. Um, um, I will come uh, to this topic of uh, uh, central banks and climate change in a second. You brought it up. Uh, but before I get to that, um, another issue that um, we are now very familiar with since the global financial crisis is unconventional monetary policy. It has become so uh, widely used that I wonder whether unconventional is the right term anymore. Uh, this being said, we have seen in this crisis emerging markets uh, uh, moving towards uh, asset purchase programs. In other words, acting in uh, this um, uh, crisis like no other with measures like uh, no other, not used before. Uh, and I'm very, very keenly interested, what is your take? Uh, you said shouldn't be considered over the counter measures. What is your take on, is this something that should be used in this dramatic crisis, but then you walk out of it as quickly as possible? Is it something that we, uh, emerging markets should build a component of their uh, policy uh, tools. Um, uh, 
and use it to achieve macroeconomic uh, objectives beyond dealing with uh, uh, the financial stress from this crisis? Well, um, I, I agree with you that um, new, new challenges require to rethinking of, uh, of what we can do to face in the best way possible those challenges. I think there are two types uh, of uh, or facilities that involve um, the usage of the central bank uh, balance sheet. And, and the first one is when liquidity is offered at a time of acute risk aversion to promote an orderly adjustment of financial markets and a sound uh, lending channel. This kind of support could be talked about uh, more of a lender of last resort type of central banking activity and is usually uh, do done on the premise of two things. One, supply ample liquidity against sound collateral and uh, the support provided is financing, not expenditure. And that I think there is broad agreement uh, that we all need to, to be very mindful of, of that need and act swiftly. And the second, which is a, a little bit more uh, with, with larger trade-offs, these unconventional monetary policies tend, are designed or tend to work as uh, support for aggregate demand and to ease financial conditions when inflation and its expectations have been persistently below target and the policy rate is constrained by the zero lower bound. And we know that this may not be, uh, let's say, the common denominator for emerging markets. We know a few emerging markets are or have been in this, in this condition. So uh, it is highly conditions driven. So um, this additional element to stimulate aggregate demand, I think should be done when you have this type of uh, constraints by the zero lower bound. And you have to be mindful about the high debt to GDP levels in that a country can have. And uh, when there are insufficient uh, macro frameworks, considering asset purchase programs may lead uh, to a situation of fiscal dominance. And, and I think we need to be mindful uh, of that uh, possibility and, and especially in countries, like I said, uh, that are capital importer economies like emerging markets, and that you need to be attractive destination uh, to, to attract capital uh, on, a continuous, on a continuous way. Mm -hmm. So I think at the end of the day also, if the asset purchase programs is misperceived or perceived as central bank financing mm -hmm. to governments, it could exert pressure on risk premia, the exchange rate, capital outflows, and, and that will go precisely in the opposite direction to the original intention, which was to ease financial conditions. Yep. So that's why I think uh, they have larger trade-offs in emerging markets, uh, but definitely it's an instrument that it depends on the circumstances uh, of each country. Uh, do you think that uh, it would be also an issue re that relates to central bank independence? Are the perceived or real? if we are to have more massive uh, move in that uh, direction in emerging markets? I, I think this goes, that question goes directly to the heart of the, of the most uh, difficult to gauge trade-off, which is how much uh, does this direct or indirect purchase of government securities by the central bank may lead you into a situation of fiscal dominance, which is, it, it may be more subtle than direct uh, losing uh, autonomy, but if a central bank feels uh, that they don't have the degrees of freedom to raise interest rates to face uh, an inflation uh, increase because of the fiscal considerations that entails, that I think uh, weakens at the end of the day uh, the central bank as an institution and reduces uh, the, the policy space that it, it can have in order to attain its, uh, one, of, one of its core mandates. So, so that I think it's part of uh, where this falls more into the art type of uh, dimension more than uh, concrete science. Mm. But uh, I think that is a, a significant risk to be mindful. So uh, in other words, uh, to sum it up, proceed if you must end with great care and think about the consequences upfront, not uh, when you're already in. Um, I want to go to a block of questions in the end. We, we have a, a bit of uh, time. That is about the future. And you spoke about a future that is going to be more shock prone because of climate change, because we might be hit by, an, by another pandemic, I would add to that, because of rapid technological transformation, digitalization that brings benefits but also risks. Uh, and in that context, uh, I want to ask you a question with 
three parts, recognizing that um, you, you might not be able to give equal uh, treatment to all of them. First, on climate, what is the role of central banks? Uh, Bank of Mexico is a member of the uh, network of uh, greening the financial system. What do you see as a must for central banks? Second, inclusion. We recognize that one of the big risks uh, from the pandemic is deepening inequalities. And that matters for financial stability because that may lead to loss of opportunity, low productivity. It may lead to damage of uh, social cohesion. So the question is, how should monetary policy think about its own potential contribution to either inequality or equality? And last but not least, uh, you spoke about digital. Uh, Alejandro, we used to say the future is digital. And then with the pandemic, the future has arrived. And that means central bank digital currencies, it's going to be happening. We at the fund take to heart our responsibility. What is the most important pitfall we should be watchful for? What is that you see as critical for an international institution like the fund to offer to buffer against this uh, pitfall. And apologies for burdening you, but I, they're kind of related. It is what is the role of monetary policy and central banks in tackling the big challenges we are faced as a world with? Well, um, very, very challenging. And, and I think three questions that uh, are of the, of the utmost importance for all. Let me start with the climate change one. Uh, and, and as you highlighted, uh, Mexico was one of the founding members of the NGFS uh, in late uh, 17. And uh, that reflected that we are, um, we truly are uh, of the view that um, we were in a, putting climate issues, and I would say in emerging markets, we have two problems, not only climate change, but also we have uh, e ecosystem degradation. Uh, in, 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 in a very significant way. So we, we need to be mindful of that. And for a very long time, it was like in, in the, in the uh, blind spot of risk management. Yeah. And climate risk materializes as credit risk. So it, it, is, it is very clear, and we can have uh, m m many examples, even in the US, the, the bankruptcy of PG&E and so on, uh, very acute examples on how uh, climate issues, either environmental degradation combined with uh, climate uh, change, can combine for very significant and material uh, credit risks. So I think uh, central banks should be mindful of risks, of long-term risks, and also of externality that are not being priced in. And uh, clearly, uh, in, in the financing side and on the corporate side, these uh, negative externalities on the environment are not being uh, fully priced in. And that's why I think we also are uh, supportive of, of, of the view of this uh, minimum carbon uh, tax approach uh, uh, that you have, uh, you, you talked about at the, in Venice at the G20 meeting. And, and I think uh, we should move in that direction, obviously being con uh, aware of uh, differences um, in income per capita and, and carbon intensity and so on. But I think it's moving in the, in the right direction. And I think it is, essential. And I think we need to train and to force our uh, financial institutions to have environmental uh, behavior as one of the key elements and, and, and not one of the standard elements in their risk uh, management assessment. And ESG criteria, I think it is essential and should be a uh, standard uh, uh, practice. And obviously very supportive of the corporate disclosure commitments on the taxonomies, on uh, all of these elements that will allow us to have comparability and to move in the direction with responsibility. And I think central banks should be part of that, of that effort. Now going into the second uh, dimension about, let's say the extended role of central banks. And, and, and let me first say that uh, for, let's say uh, income distribution and inequality, probably the worst element uh, that affects uh, uh, inequality and income distribution and in emerging market we have experienced this uh, in a sour way is instability either price uh, insta uh, pr price instability or inflation and financial instability so our core mandates 
move us in, in, in the direction of trying to create and foster conditions that can allow for uh, ine inequality to be adequately uh, uh, fight, uh, uh, fought and, 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 and really did reduce uh, inequality. But, but you also highlighted into a, another dimension that has been uh, not so much uh, addressed, which is how can central banks engage and with technology and, and innovation and trying to develop more vibrant financial ecosystems to really create a level playing field for all. Uh, and we talk about playing field and opportunities more in terms of education and so on, and, and that is true. But also in terms of financial access, that is critical. And emerging markets have faced for a very long time the problem of the rigidities of it is very expensive to have a branch of a commercial bank in a very long uh, uh, a population and, and small population, a rural population. Uh, but now with technology, that can change dramatically. So I think that central banks can be, let me put it this way, champions of efficiency in the financial services and financial sectors for the benefit for all. And, and that, I think, uh, leads us to, to this uh, uh, third uh, uh, issue, which is uh, about the money, uh, crypto space, and how can we put all of the technology and, and the uh, alternatives that technology can offer to, to the best use in our, in our societies. And I think this is, uh, in terms of crypto assets, uh, well, let me, a few words about money. And, and even, even though, uh, since, since the origins of fiduciary uh, money, uh, authorities, probably uh, uh, have not faced a challenge like the ones we are facing. Because right now, uh, private digital payments and private, uh, private digital money can really uh, induce a currency substitution. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge uh, for central banks. And, and, and this brings us to the question, what is the best uh, form of money uh, in a society? And I think history has numerous examples on, on, uh, that where a general, generalized use of private money without a lender of last resort combined with inadequate institutions and external and internal shocks resulted in an economic crisis and uh, affect, uh, uh, welfare being diminished. I think virtual assets are not to be legal tender to meet financial obligations or be used as currency, but rather treated as kind of commercial goods uh, for all legal uh, purposes. Crypto assets or tokens could have some medium of exchange properties, but as I said, uh, I think they grossly fail as a store of value unit of account and a good and efficient payment uh, mechanism. And, and I think these, uh, this is, the, the time is of the essence. Yeah. I think, um, we have heard uh, and we have been in many, many discussions in, in international fora about what is the optimal C CBDC and how we need to understand like the 50 uh, different uh, uh, combinations that can drive into different CBDCs, uh, technology, blockchain, not blockchain, centralized, not centralized, and so on. And, and, and I think that is all very good. But that, I don't know if we're going to have the time to wait and see which one is the optimal solution. I think in payment systems, there is a lot of inertia in every country. And that's why there is such a, a clear divergence about payment system in different countries, yeah. even within advanced economies and, and also among emerging market. There is a lot of path dependent and persistent about in, in these solutions. So probably the question will be the other way around. How can each country develop the most suitable CBDC the, in the fastest way possible to reduce this space where some of these, I think, inferior uh, money solutions, uh, they, they are hungry for the senior edge returns, and that they have a lot of incentives to try to consolidate. So the time we devote towards the, the deciding the optimal solution, I think it's time that could put us more at risk. And at the end of the day, I think probably the, the delivering the fastest and, and the most uh, readily available CBDC for each country would be the right uh, approach to reduce this space and provide uh, these digital solutions in the best uh, uh, public format, which is provided by a central bank, as history has uh, shown us, uh, in, the, in the best way possible. Uh, in other words, uh, if I take it as an advice to the fund, this last point you're making, uh, the pitfall you're pointing to is the danger of inaction or slow action. 
uh, with consequences for countries, payment systems, and uh, the ability of economies to function at uh, the, their highest uh, level. Uh, this has been a tremendous uh, uh, experience. I cannot let you go without asking you one pressing question. Um, in weeks, uh, the IMF is going to issue the largest in our history uh, allocation of special drawing rights, uh, $650 billion equivalent. As a central banker in emerging markets, how would you see that? What, what is the, mo the, the biggest value it brings? What we should concentrate uh, on? Well, uh, Cristalina, let, let me first uh, congratulate uh, you and your hard work for, for having that accomplishment. We all know it's been very hard and it's been uh, a tough process, but I think it is extremely valuable for emerging markets. Probably, if you, if you highlight one of my constant or the common denominator in, in my differences between advanced and emerging markets, it is precisely that we are capital importer economies and we have insufficient access to sources of finance. Mm -hmm. So fostering and, 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 and uh, helping us have stronger buffers clearly helps us in, in, in probably in the area where it is, it is most needed, uh, which is to uh, be uh, able to attract mm. uh, capital and to consolidate and, and to stabilize and to have a, a clear, uh, uh, let's say, payoff performance. So uh, stronger buffers are essential in emerging markets. It goes to the core and in the midst of a, of a very challenging times. We are all seeing how complicated it is to remain an attractive uh, uh, destination for investment. And this increase in uh, uh, external buffers it's clearly very, very beneficial for all emerging markets, especially. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, I am very grateful to the membership uh, for delivering this allocation. It was important when we started working on it, and it has become more important in light of these di divergent uh, recoveries. Uh, let me uh, wrap it up in the following way. Central banks will have to wrestle with the immediate, very significant, pressing challenges for the recovery that they need to support. And at the same time, tune their activities so they are effective to deal with these big issues that we uh, spoke towards the end of our conversation and you, you addressed uh, in your uh, lecture. What you have done today is to give me and the audience confidence that central banks can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I am extremely grateful to you for giving us this confidence that there is strength in experience and maturity of judgment and that uh, there are people like you who have dedicated their lives to public service and have built this capacity so we can face crisis and come to them and change in a way that is beneficial for our societies. Thank you very, very much, Alejandro. On behalf of all the audience that is watching us, bravo. Thank you Thank very you. much, Cristalina. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Stay healthy.